We've been talking for the last several weeks about the responsibilities morally, spiritually, uh, when it comes to our personal lives in terms of dating, in terms of romance, in terms of uh, finding relationships. We've talked about uh, biblical wisdom concerning uh, the pursuit of marriage, finding that life partner that so many of us would love to have. Now, for all of you, I know I'm looking svelte and sexy these days, but I am taken. I hate to bust your bubble, but uh, Martin's single. If anybody wants to come snatch him up, <laughs> amen. But uh, we've been talking for the last several weeks about these things, and we've gotten through where we, be we were talking about marriage last week and the week before. This week, I think we're going to begin to wind it up. Now, I say we're going to begin to wind it up. That doesn't mean that this might not take a couple of weeks. Because the subject matter that we're going to close with is the subject matter of liberty. I did title the study Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Happiness. We started out at the very beginning of our study talking about the books of the Bible and understanding their purpose and their role and understanding which books are law, which books are wisdom, uh, you know, which books are mandating things from God and which books are simply offering us good solid advice and counsel on how to live a healthy, happy, prosperous life, which is what God wants for us. And I know through the course of this study, I've said things uh, that probably curled some people's hair and had a lot of people just chomping at the bit. And I'm sure there was a bunch of folk, because we get a lot of folks who are not part of the LGBT community who watch our videos. I know because... I've gotten emails from them. And uh, there is a pastor's wife, the pastor who baptized me in Jesus' name many, many, many years ago. Uh, his wife has watched our videos because I've heard from her. And uh, so, you know, I mean, there's, there's a lot of people out there watching. And I'm sure there's quite a few of our good holiness friends who've labeled me a heretic. And they say, oh, he's full of baloney. He, he's telling people that uh, fornication isn't as big a thing as, as what they think it is. And the Bible says, blah, 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 you know. And like I said, if you take something out of context, honey, you can condemn people for chewing gum. Okay, you must always approach the word of every portion and every part that you read. You must look at it as part of the whole. You have to look at it as part of the greater. If you don't, if you pull this passage out, well, this passage clearly says thus and so. Yeah, the only problem is what you're saying it clearly says contradicts what it says over here. Oh, the Bible doesn't contradict it. No, it doesn't. The problem is people do. And I'm going to tell you, growing up in the fundamentalist church, I saw contradictions every day. I saw contradiction all the time. One minute God loved me, the next minute God couldn't wait to send me to hell because I slipped and, and hit my finger with a hammer and cussed or something. You know, all of a sudden God was ready to ship me off to hell in a handbasket. All of a sudden the grace of God didn't exist anymore. I don't know where it went to. Yeah. It was there the day they begged me to come to the altar and pray through, but it sure did disappear fast. So you've got to take every part of Scripture and you have got to reconcile it against the whole. When you do this, people who want to approach the Word of God legalistically, they don't like that. They're not interested in doing that. No, they want to take every little portion they read and they want to make an edict. They want to make a mandate. They want to make a law. They want to make some kind of a dogma out of it. Yeah. 
Every little part, Martin, is, is another dogma, it's another law, it's another rule. Well, I've got news for you, that's not how it works. I say in this church all the time, you've heard me say it so many times, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. That is how God gives us the truth. The reason he gives it to us in this 10,000 piece puzzle is because this is how God weeds through sincere people and religious people. Okay. If you're sincere, you'll be willing to put in the time to put the puzzle together and to try to see what the final picture is, what the full picture is. If you're not sincere and you're not willing to invest the time, what, is, what did Paul tell Timothy? He said, study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of God. So what Paul said to Timothy was, A, hey, study to show yourself approved to God. Show God you're sincere. Show God you're real. Study. See, a lot of people think reading the Bible, studying the Bible. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> no. You can read Shakespeare's plays. That doesn't mean you're studying Shakespeare's plays. But if you're going to study Shakespeare's plays, there are words and there are terms he uses that are archaic, they're, they're old English uses that are not used that way in our modern vernacular. You're going to have to go and look those words up. You're going to have to say, well, what does he mean by a bard? What does he mean by this? What did, you know what I'm saying? You, 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 to, to study it means that you go much deeper. You go into much greater depth and you explore it much more carefully. Well, a lot of people read the Bible and they think they understand what they're reading. No, they don't. Because they're not studying it, they're reading it. I'm going to tell you a little secret, folks. And I, I, know, I know when I say things, unfortunately, I have this big cloud that kind of rides over my shoulder every day of my life. I grew up in the fundamentalist church. I am so accustomed to every word you say being judged and criticized and picked apart and, you know, dissected that I honestly, and, 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 and this is the truth, I tend to do it to myself even while I'm preaching. I, I'll say things and in the back of my mind I'm thinking, oh boy, I already know what the fundamentalists are going to say about that. I know what these are going to say about that. You know, they're not going to like this. And you know, because they love to just pour out their words of stupidity upon everybody that says anything they don't agree with, you know. And unfortunately, I, I have that little cloud that just rides over my shoulder and I can't help but think, Sometimes when I go to say things, but I'm going to tell you a little secret, okay? Let me help you understand something. One of the worst things, Lord, should I say this or shouldn't I? I think I should. One of the worst things that ever happened to the Christian faith was Bibles being printed in the common man's language and every ignoramus <laughs> on the planet getting a hold of one. It's the truth. Yeah. I'm going to tell you something. First century Christians served the Lord, worshipped the Lord, made heaven after they died and never held a Bible in their hand. They never held an Old Testament. You know why? Because the scrolls of Scripture were kept in the synagogue. They never had access to even go look at the scrolls. Okay? They never, no. When they went to temple, that is where the Scriptures were read. Right. They didn't have a Bible, Martin, to read. 
They didn't have a Bible to study. You didn't wind up with every nut in the church having a different interpretation and a different understanding and everybody in town arguing amongst themselves as to what this means and what that means. And, you know, you didn't have that in the beginning. And it was simple. God called leaders. He called teachers. He called, the Bible said, God hath given us apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. The fivefold ministry. That is how people learned. That is how information was disseminated. That is how they grew. Now, we know that the apostles held, and to this day hold, final authority for all matters of doctrine and faith in the church. Okay? So you always defer to the apostles. But in the early church, they didn't have even a New Testament or a collection of all the writings of the apostles. Most congregations throughout the world were blessed if they had in their possession a single copy of one of the Gospels. They might have Mark, they might have Luke, they might have Matthew, they might have John. But they were blessed if they had a copy of one. And this was true, folks, going way up into the 3rd, 4th, and 5th centuries, okay? You had epistles written to certain congregations in certain locations. So we know, for instance, the Corinthians received their epistle. But then someone would take the time and put forth the effort, Martin, to copy it word for word. Every punctuation identical. Because that is how important the apostles' authority was considered, okay? And they then would pass around copies of the epistles so that others might have. So if you were really blessed in the first and second century, you might have a gospel. You might have an epistle. Well, you remember Paul said, some of you say I'm of, of, I'm of Paul, and some of you say I'm of Apollos, and others say I'm of this one and I'm of that one. Well, you have to understand, there's a reason for that. Because those are the men who had established a, re a uh, relationship with that particular congregation. And if they, if they received any epistles, if they received any letters from an authority in the faith, it was from those individuals. So they identified with that individual. Do you follow what I'm saying? Not everybody had ever read Paul's epistles. A lot of times Paul went to other churches and introduced them. They didn't even know who he was. They had no clue who Paul was. So now I say all this to say, I talked in the course of this study, I've talked about the fact that we are not under the law. We are not under the law. And things within the law have been misrepresented, like the issue of fornication, like the issue of marriage, has been completely blown up and misrepresented. It's nowhere near the way it's represented in Scripture, the Old Testament. But then there are going to be those people, Martin, who immediately jump the gun and say, Oh, okay, so the pastor's saying, I can go out and do whatever I want to do, and it's all good. Wrong. Wrong. I don't know what other affirming pastors tell you. I don't care what they tell you. I won't tell you the truth. Wrong. You cannot go out and do whatever you want to do, however you want to do it. And it's all good. The Bible tells us, what shall we continue in sin that grace might abound? God forbid. Well, but pastor, you said there's a sin not unto death. No, I didn't say that. The Bible says that. Yes, there is a sin not unto death. Yes, there are offenses that you can commit that will disappoint your parents, it will break their heart, but they're not going to kick you out of the house for it. Yes, there are things you can do that are going to deeply disturb your spouse and make them very upset, but they're not going to divorce you over it. 
but you still disappoint them. Right. You still break their heart. Yeah. Just because you're not going to experience the ultimate punishment or the ultimate retribution for doing it, does that mean then you should go ahead and do it? No. So yeah, there are sins that are not unto death. There are things that you can do that are contrary to God's design and God's desire for you. And God is not going to throw you into hell for doing it, but does that mean you should do it? No, it's still a sin. It's still an offense to God. Do you follow what I'm saying? Well, but if I'm not going to go to hell over it, then what difference does it make? Uh, I'll tell you why. Because taking that attitude is the very attitude that's going to put you in hell over it. <laughs> See, if you begin to approach things as, well, I can do it because it don't matter no way, then you are an unprofitable servant. You are careless. And you remember the story of the unprofitable servant? You remember what happened to him? Word of God said he was cast into outer darkness where there was weeping and gnashing of teeth. You've got to be careful about being careless in how you approach things. Just because I'm saying there are sins not unto death, I'm not giving you license to go out there and do everything any old way you want to do it. That's not what I've been teaching. But now we need to look at the issue of liberty. Christian liberty. Now that I've taught on those other issues, and we've, we've tapped on the liberty issue a little bit, now we need to understand the concept. That's why I say liberty to the end, okay? To pull everything together. Let's begin with a passage in 1 Corinthians chapter... Uh, I better put my glasses on or I'm going to give you the wrong passage. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 6 through 13. The Apostle Paul writes to the church at Corinth, but to us there is but one God, the Father of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. Howbeit there is not in every man that knowledge. In other words, not everybody understands that there's one God and there's one Lord. Okay, there's one God and then there's one physical manifestation of that God whom we call Lord. For some with conscience of the idol unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol and their conscience being weak is defiled. But meat commendeth us not to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. Aha. First thing to understand about our liberty. We should never allow our liberty to become a stumbling block to someone else. Unlike the world that lives its life. If I see one more mother on a TV talk show talking about, well, I lived my life for my kids for 18 years, and bless God, I'm just going to live for myself now. And that's why I wear my little short shorts, and that's why I wear my little, you know, sexy bra tops, and that's why I run around looking like a hooker. And, and my kids say they're embarrassed by me, and my kids say it troubles them that I look like that. But you know what? I've lived for them. I'm just living for myself. i got news for you, sweetheart. You're going to be mother till you die. If you think just because they hit 18 that all of a sudden you have no obligation to them, you are as wrong as wrong can be. But that is a carnal mindset. Now, I'm going to do my thing. And if you don't like it, tough. It don't bother me no way. Hey, I'm not going to let you bother me. It's a, well, I've got news for you, folks. As a child of God, we don't think that way. 
as children of God, not just in church, but in our daily lives, remember life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, in our daily lives, we are conscious that we are part of the greater body of Christ. And as part of the greater body of Christ, we are responsible to the weaker among us. That we be careful not to allow our liberty to be a stumbling block to them. Well, what do you mean by that, Pastor? I don't believe for a minute there's anywhere in the Bible said I'm going to hell if I walk into a bar room. I don't believe the Bible says if you go into a nightclub, you're going to, you know, split hell wide open because you walked into a nightclub. Do I go to those places? No. Why do I not go to those places? Because I do not want my liberty to be a stumbling block to the weaker. There are people, Martin, who can't go into a nightclub or into a bar except they are induced into drinking. There are people who can't go into a bar, can't go into a nightclub, except that they find themselves going home with somebody and not being very smart, not being very careful. There are people who go into nightclubs and into bars and they carry themselves and they do things and they say things that aren't in keeping with the way a Christian ought to do or say things. Now, I might be able to go into a bar and nightclub and never do any of those things. I might be able to go into a nightclub and I'm, I'm still the same preacher man I was outside the bar in the nightclub. But now here's a number of problems. Number one, I go into the nightclub and there are people who, the only reason they go into a nightclub is to find somebody to lay down with. I'm going to talk plain, folks. Yeah. I told you, I, I don't have time to be mincing words. A lot of people, the only reason, booby, they go into a bar is to find somebody to lay down with. And you know what they think when they see me go in? They assume that's why I'm there. Well, look at that preacher. He going in that place to cruise. He going in that place to drink. He going in that place to flirt and to do blah, blah, blah. Nope. The best way I can prevent you from getting the wrong message by not going in at all. And do you know what? It don't hurt me no way, no how to live my life in an effort to be mindful of the weaker. Do you follow what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. Okay? It's about integrity. It's about reputation. When I was growing up as a kid, you know, in the Pentecostal church, my God have mercy, uh, you avoided alcohol to such a degree that... You know, I tease sometimes and say you couldn't even drink cough syrup because it had a, an amount of alcohol in it. Uh, but if your car broke down in the nearest business with a phone, this is back before cell phones. I'm old enough, kids, you know. I, I was around long before cell phones. If the nearest pay phone, and for you youngins don't know what a pay phone is, that's a phone you'd go to and drop a little drachma in, you know, and it would make it work. <laughs> If the nearest phone was in a bar, you'd walk 10 miles out of your way. I'm not kidding. Done it. Done it. So you would not go in that bar. And you say, well, well, that's stupid. Well, I suppose at some level you can say that, but you know what? I've done it, and I don't regret it to this minute. Why? Because all I needed was somebody seeing me go into that bar. You follow what I'm saying? Yeah. All I needed. See, Tommy, unlike the Jehovah's Witness, it's not about somebody seeing you do it. Because it's like, oh, you're, I need to go report you because you've done something bad. No, no, no. No, it's about what if somebody who's weaker in the faith sees me going in there. And they get it in their head. Well, the preacher was going, look at that. He was going in the middle of the day to get himself a drink. He was going in the middle of the day to pick him up somebody. Do you follow what I'm saying? It's, it's about integrity. It's about reputation. It doesn't have anything to do with. There's no assumption that you're doing wrong by going in there. But the weaker, 
tend to assume. The weaker tend to make guesses and judgments, okay? And so as a Christian, we are always mindful of the weaker. So Paul is saying here, he's using the example of eating meat that has been offered to idols. And he said, honestly, if you eat meat that's been offered to an idol, he said, we know there is no deity behind the idol. We know that idol's nothing but a piece of wood or a piece of rock or a piece of metal. So therefore, he said, you're neither the worse for it nor are you the better for it. It doesn't help you, it doesn't hurt you. He said, it, it, it doesn't really matter one way or the other. But if there's a brother who's weak in the faith, and they have an issue with you eating that meat because to them it seems like, well, but Paul, you shouldn't be doing that, you know? Paul said, okay, if that be the case, then I won't eat it because I'm going to be mindful of the weaker. Do you follow what I'm saying? So he said, verse 9, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, but take heed lest any, excuse me, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. For if any man see thee, which hast knowledge, sit at meat in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? And through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish. For whom Christ died. But when ye sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will. Now listen. If meat make my brother to offend, he did not say, if meat offend my brother. He said, if me make my, in other words, if my taking my liberties because I know that an idol is nothing but a piece of wood or a piece of, he said, but then he turns around and becomes emboldened to do these things, but he doesn't have the knowledge. He doesn't have the understanding. He doesn't see things the way I do. Do you follow what I'm saying? Paul said, now you've turned around and you've made him a partaker with the idolaters. So you were approaching it from a different understanding. You were approaching it from a different place. But if your actions then embolden the weaker one to do these things, but he's not doing it from the same place of knowledge, now you've turned around and you've convinced him it's okay to go and have, you know, a party with the idolaters, you know, and eat their meats offered to idols. You know what I'm saying? That's what Paul's talking about. So he's not saying simply that, it, that the brother is offended by your actions, but rather that your actions embolden your brother to commit an offense himself or herself. And through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. But when ye sin so against the brethren... And wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. So there's, boy, you talk about dedication. Paul said, you know what? If, if my doing that is going to cause my brother to do something he shouldn't be doing because he don't understand things the way I do. I don't believe if you have a drink, you're going to go straight to hell. I don't believe this, that, that the Holy Ghost is going to come skid, you know, grease the skid so you'll slip straight into hell upon the occasion of your death. However, Especially in the modern world, we know how precarious uh, alcoholism can be. How easily someone who is an alcoholic can fall off the wagon and be right back into the role. I have an uncle who quit drinking many, many years ago, bless his heart, and he's still off 
boobs. He, he said, when I finally got off of that stuff, he said, I could not believe how clear-headed I was. I could not believe how life changed for me. He said, I would never go back to drinking for all the money in the world. And this was, you know, oh Lord, 30 years, 35 years ago, he quit drinking. Uncle Eddie, actually. But you know, there's a reason Protestant churches don't serve wine with communion. You didn't know that, did you? You thought we use grape juice just because. No. We use grape juice because it is non-alcoholic. Because even that little cup of wine could be enough to cause a weaker brother to fall off the wagon. That little sip of wine could be just enough. Somebody who's struggling with alcoholism, that could be just enough to tip the scales. You follow what I'm saying? Why do we, when we have church functions, why do we not serve wine? Why do we Pentecostal folks have weddings and we don't have alcohol at our weddings? Well, now a lot of them, of course, it's because they approach things from a very legalistic perspective. Oh, if you drink, you know, if you have alcohol, my God, you're unholy, you're unclean. Well, I got news for you. Every apostle and every prophet in the Bible was unholy and unclean then because every one of them drank alcohol. So I don't believe the issue is truly you're unholy and unclean. But I do believe there is cause for not having these substances at your affairs. You come to a birthday party at my house, you will not find alcohol there. You come to a picnic at my house, we're not going to have beer. You come to, uh, you know, New Year's Day celebration or New Year's Eve celebration, we're not going to have champagne. You follow what I'm saying? Because we have to be mindful of the weaker. We have to be mindful of those, Martin, for whom that might be a dangerous thing. You know what I'm saying? They see you having a drink, and they see that you can drink a few sips and put it down and never touch it again, and they say, well, bless God, if Brother Charles can do it, I should be able to do it, but they can't. That's the problem. And then they try to imitate you. They try to take the liberty that they see you taking, and they find out, uh-oh, now it's got me in its grasp. Now I'm caught again. Now I'm stuck again. So a lot of a lot of the things that we refer to as holiness standards, again, a lot of people approach them from a very legalistic perspective. But if you understand it from a proper biblical perspective, it's not about you're holy if you do these things. Or you're not holy if you don't do these things. No. It is about you are being mindful of the weaker. This is, I'm, I'm going to go somewhere tonight that, oh, there's going to be people having a hissy fit over this now. I do not like young ladies coming into church. Now, if it's all you got to wear, wear what you got. But I don't need to see every inch of cleavage you own. I do not need to walk down the shadow of the valley of death every time I look at your chest. Men, you do not need to be wearing pants so tight that I can count every little thing you've got going on. If you're a child of God, you should approach things differently. Do you know whether you like it or not? And I told you, this pastor is going to tell you the truth, folks. The Bible teaches modesty in dress. If you're a child of God, you don't dress like a hooker. If you're a child of God, you don't dress like your body is a product that is for sale. And you're trying to draw as much attention to it as you possibly can. Now, am I saying you've got to wear dresses down to your ankles and sleeves down to... Listen, I'm wearing short sleeves tonight. If there's anybody in this room or anybody on the camera getting excited because I'm wearing short sleeves and you see my forearms, honey, go find you a doctor fast because there's something wrong with you. I know holiness people that have a hissy fit because I'm wearing short sleeves. 
But do I believe in modest attire? Absolutely, I believe in modest attire. I remember years ago, I had a neighbor, I've told you about him in other uh, anecdotes that I've shared. He lived behind me in an apartment behind me, and he used to come over to my apartment a lot. He was a single fella, drove truck, and uh, always had a beer in his hand and a, and a uh, cigarette in the other hand, you know. And he'd knock on my door, and it's high, it's Texas, and I, I don't even recall back then, I'm not sure my apartment even had air conditioning, but anyway, it was hot. And I'd be running around, you know, without a shirt on in the apartment, you know, and he'd knock on the door, well, I'd go grab me my bathrobe, put my bathrobe on, and then I'd answer the door. And he'd say, Chuck, why do you do that? He said, I don't care if you run around with a, a shirt on, you know, it don't bother me no way. Now, he was a straight man, you know. And I said, no, I, I, that's, I believe in modesty, and, and that's just something I'm supposed to do. It's something I need to do. It's that easy. It's that easy. We got people in the LGBT community, dear Jesus, you try to teach modesty, and they're just going to have a hissy fit. They're just going to have a fit. Well, I'm sorry, it is scriptural. You come to church with your breasts hanging out of your shirt, and we've had gals that did it. You get out to the altar to pray with somebody, and I got news for you, honey. The only thing they're going to be able to focus on are your bazookas standing there staring at them. You're a distraction. You're a distraction. When that person comes in the house of God who really needs to be able to focus on the message and really needs to be able to focus, and you, gay boy, are standing there in your tight jeans that are so tight that we can see everything you own, you're a distraction. I've been to affirming churches, and there were men in this church wearing leather pants. Yeah. Oh, well, it's a gay affirming church. I'm walking in the liberty of the Holy Ghost. It is a distraction. You don't have enough wisdom in your brain to know that you can wear lead all you want to when you go here, there, and everywhere. But in the house of God, it is a distraction. It is not appropriate. It is not necessary. People online, y'all can get mad at me all you want to. I don't care. As a child of God, I live my life with the knowledge that I am part of the greater body. I am mindful of those who are weaker in the faith and weaker. And because of that reason, I make choices and I do things in such a way to be mindful of the weaker. James chapter 1, verses 21 through 25. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, no, I didn't finish 1 Corinthians 10. Uh, let me finish the last couple of verses there. Yeah, I, th I thought I had finished, but I realized I didn't. But, all right, I'm going to go 1 Corinthians 10, 28 through 33. But if any man say unto you, this is offered un, uh, in sacrifice unto idols, Eat not for his sake that showed it, and for conscience' sake. For the earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof. Conscience, I say, not thine own, but of the other. For why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? For if I by grace be a partaker... Why am I evil spoken of for that for which I give thanks? Whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God, even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the prophet of many, that they may be saved. I was invited one time years ago by a young man I knew who was Indian. And 
he invited me to his house. He said, oh, my family on such and such a day, you know, we have this celebration. It's like Thanksgiving, you know, similar to Thanksgiving. And he said, I'd love for you to come. I said, oh, okay, I'll come. So I went. And I went into his house, and all of a sudden I found out that it was actually a religious holiday in deference to some Hindu god. And they had a little idol of this Hindu god, and they had <coughs> incense burning, and they were putting cash offerings in front of this idol, and they had this big dinner that they serve, and it's all part of this religious thing. And I said, oh, is, is, this a, is this a religious thing? I thought you said it was like Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is just a secular holiday. You know, I said, I, I didn't realize it was, it was associated with Hinduism or what have you. You know, and he said, oh, yeah, but and he explained it to me. And I said, I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to leave. I can't. I can't participate in this. You know, I said, I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to leave. And I stayed and I visited with them. I tried to be as congenial and as nice as I could. But before they ate, I left. Did I do that for me? Could I have stayed and eaten? Would I have suddenly believed in this Hindu God? Would I suddenly have been falling down worshiping this Hindu God? No, I would not have. However, I would have been saying to this Hindu man, that my God means so little to me that I can commit fornication, I can commit spiritual adultery on my God sitting down in honor of your God. Do you follow what I'm saying? So what I was doing, I was not doing for me, I was doing it as a testimony to Him. I wanted Him to understand that my fidelity is to Jesus Christ. Anything that would put me in a position that I am recognizing or honoring any other deity, fictional or fact, I, I cannot participate in that. You follow what I'm saying? This is what Paul's talking about. It's about, you've got to keep in mind your testimony. You know, I've had people say, uh, if, if somebody dies and they're having a funeral in a certain type of religious organization, you know, would you go? And I say, no. I don't. I will not walk into one of their structures. I will not walk into one of their buildings. Because if I do, and someone sees me, they say, oh, look, Pastor Charles thinks that that religion is as valid as anybody else's is. He thinks that belief system is as okay as anybody. You, do you follow what I'm saying? Looks like I'm kind of endorsing it, I'm, you know. Now what I will do, regardless of the faith, you know, regardless of what belief system, Hindu, Buddhist, whatever, I will go to the cemetery. But I'm not going to go into their temple. I'm not going to go into their religious structure. Do you follow what I'm saying? And uh, it, because again, it's just, it's an issue of conscience, and this is something... I don't want to send the wrong message, and I don't want to cause... I don't want somebody to say, Well, I saw Pastor Charles going into that Mormon uh, church, so I guess I can go to church with my Mormon friend. Again, that person may not understand the Word of God anywhere near enough, Martin, to guard themselves from the deception of Mormonism. Right. And if they see me going into the Mormon church, you know what I'm saying? They may think... Well, you know, Brother Charles went into a Mormon church. They don't understand. I'm not going in there for a church service. I'm not going in there to, you know, participate in there. I'm going in there for a funeral. Or I'm going in there for a wedding or whatever, you know. No, I'll, I'll go elsewhere. I'll go to the reception. I'll go to the graveyard, what have you. Uh, or if, if that, for whatever reason, won't work, then I make other arrangements. I'll go see the family personally. You know, I'll participate with them personally. There are ways to approach things, but you do it because you're mindful of the weaker. Now, let's quickly run to James chapter 1, verses 21 through 25. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness 
and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man, beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. In other words, he looks in the mirror, walks away from the mirror three minutes later, can't remember what he looked like a minute ago. Verse 25. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty. You see, in Christ, we're no longer under the law. We are under a new law. It is the law of liberty. We're not bound by all these rules and regulations. No, we've been set free from all the rules and regulations. And continueth therein, in what? In the law of liberty, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. If there is any problem we have in the Christian church today, it is this. People talk about liberty, they hear about liberty, they sing songs, he set me free, yes, he set me free. And then they walk out of the church and immediately they go right back into a legalistic mindset. They go right back into a legalistic understanding of God and God's word. Immediately, they're like the person who just looked at themselves in a mirror a minute ago, and they walk out, and it's like, oh, what does my hair look like now? What, uh, I just looked at it a minute ago, but what does it look like now? Because they forget what they saw just a couple minutes ago. You see, this is the problem with the church, and I've preached on this in, in recent months. I've talked about this, how Paul said, if you're going to be blessed in your deeds, then, honey, you better remember the issue of liberty. You better remember that you're walking in the liberty of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and you're not walking under the precepts and the mandates and the dictates and the dogmas of the law. Most Christians today... That's not, that's not at all their experience. They come into the church, they sing songs that celebrate all these wonderful spiritual principles, and then they go out the door and they are right back into the old rut. They're right back into the legalistic mindset, oh, I can't do this, I can't do that, I can't do this, I can't do that. You see, the difference between the law and the gospel is simple. The difference between the law and the gospel is in the law, if you did it, you were condemned. In the gospel, you can do it and you're not condemned, but that doesn't mean there may not be repercussions. You know, we talk about, in America, we talk about the First Amendment. Everybody's got the right to speak their mind. Everybody has the right to an opinion. We have freedom of speech in America. Hallelujah, glory to God. Roseanne Barr just exercised her freedom of speech. Yep, she did. And she paid a big price for it. Well, that ain't right. Why isn't it right? If I walk up to the biggest black man I see and say, Hey there, Mr. Man. And he punches my lights out. He had every right to do it. I had no business doing that. That was stupid. No, just because you can do something doesn't mean it's wise to do it. That's right. Do you follow what I'm saying? Yes. That is the issue of liberty. You see, no longer are we under the law so that we're condemned and we're criticized and we're pushed down into hell over every little thing. No, now it's different because now we choose not to do these things. 
that displease the Lord. We choose not to do these things that tarnish our reputation, our integrity, our testimony. We choose. And if by any chance we slip, we fall, and we make the wrong choice, there's still grace. Hallelujah. We're still under grace. We've never stepped away from grace. We've never walked outside of God's grace. Do you follow what I'm saying? Right. Because the law condemns based on the action. There's no mercy. There's, there's, no, there's no room for play in the law. But in the gospel, there is. We're in a state of liberty. God says, listen, you're... You're free virtually to do anything. There, you, pretty much you can do whatever you want to do. The only problem is wisdom dictates be mindful of your... For instance, now Tommy's an only child so he won't understand this. I'm the oldest of three brothers. You let me go out and do something when Dallas was little. And there come Dallas waddling out, three years old, and he thinks he can do what Big Brother's doing. Do you follow what I'm saying? He thinks he can imitate Big Brother, and he can do it like Big Brother. He'll see Big Brother jacking up a car, using a car jack. You ever seen a baby go out there, and they, they try to grab that car jack? You know, they think they're going to jack up that car, and they haven't got enough strength to even move the the jack handle, you know? But they'll, they think they can do it because they've seen you do it. So by God, if you can do it, I can do it. Well, as Christians, I can do anything, but I have to be mindful of my little brother. I've got to be mindful of my little brother. When I was growing up, there were times, Tommy, there were things I couldn't do right then because Dallas was right there. And it wouldn't have been a good idea for me to go way out in the water like that because he'd have tried to go way out in the water and drown. Do you follow what I'm saying? So the, the perfect law of liberty is no longer about condemnation. It's no longer about guilt. It is no longer about law and transgression. No, now under the perfect law of liberty, we have choices. We have the freedom to make choices. And the Bible says, Concerning the Lord, we love Him because He first loved us. And we respond to God's love. We respond to the love of God reaching out to us by loving Him back, by loving Him in return. We talked about what the Lord said. Love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, with all your soul. And the more... We come into relationship with him the more we make choices it's not about law it's not about law are you living your life differently absolutely are you making choices differently absolutely could you do that if you wanted to absolutely if Tommy and I, I'm going to say it if he and I want to have champagne on New Year's Eve when we're by ourselves in our home and we want to toast, you know, to the new year, with a, then have at it. But you'll never see us do it in a public. Do you follow what I'm saying? Because of the weaker. So, the perfect law of liberty is a very different thing than the Old Testament law of Moses. It's a very different thing. But you see, sadly, we have Christians, especially in Pentecostal circles, as well as fundamentalist and evangelical who have turned the New Testament into a whole nother set of laws. You can't do this, you're going to hell. You can't do that, you're going to hell. You can't do this, you can't do that. You can't do this, you can't do that. If you do this, you're not holy. If you don't do this, you're not holy. Now, doing those things doesn't no more make you holy than, you know, taking a milk bath makes you cheese. Now, and it's not about making you holy. It is about your testimony. It is about your integrity. It is about being mindful of the weaker. That's all it is. You do those things for those reasons. That's one of the reasons, to be honest with you, I, I get frustrated. I'm almost done with tonight. We, we got through, actually, two of the major uh, first two portions of Scripture. We've got 
another four or five to go. Because I told you, this is, a, this is a good area of study, though. Do you, are you getting something out of this? This is one of the things about, quote-unquote, holiness Pentecost that irritates me to no end. Drives me crazy. When I came into the holiness movement as a young man, I've, I've always approached the scriptures from a certain perspective and with a certain understanding. I understood why. You know, if you notice when I teach on things, I'm always trying to help you understand why. The why God has it. You know, why. Well, when I read about, for instance, you know, holiness people don't wear jewelry. They don't wear any kind of jewelry, no kind of brooches or hairpins or necklaces or earrings, none of that. And to this day, I still wear a cheap watch. Say, well, why do you do that? I'll tell you why I do that. So you people online who have nothing better to do than gripe about pastors and preachers running around with Rolexes on and all that foolishness, I want you to see, I wear a $20 Casio watch. I've been wearing watches like this for decades. Decades. Why do I do it? I'll tell you why I do it. Because I believe it's the godly way to do things. I don't want somebody coming in this church hungry. I don't want somebody coming in this church struggling and looking at the pastor and me wearing a thousand, fifteen hundred, two thousand, twenty thousand dollars on my wrist. That's garbage. I am as offended by that as you are. I am as offended by that as the people who gripe and groan about preachers who do those things. I don't even wear French cuff shirts. Think I don't, you think I don't do that on purpose? Yes, I do do it on purpose. Cufflinks. I, I look at these preachers. They make me laugh. These TV preachers, all with their French cuff shirts, you know, they got to have their little fancy, pretty expensive cufflinks there, Martin, for their pretty little shirts. What in the world's wrong with you? They sell shirts with buttons. But see, you know, people love to make all these generalizations about preachers being money honey, uh, money hungry and money grubbers, you know, and they're trying to live large, and they don't ever pay attention to the fact that Pastor Charles wears suits from Burlington that cost 140 bucks. You don't see me going somewhere spend $1,000 on a suit. If I had it, I wouldn't spend it. You know why? Because I need... That money that I'd be wasting on my clothes for somebody that comes in the church and needs something to eat. And that's what the Bible teaches us. That's where our priorities ought to be, Martin. My priorities are there. Holiness people are not supposed to wear jewelry, not because by not wearing it, they're holy. No. Because they're supposed to be demonstrating they have a different priority in life. I'm not looking to impress. I'm not looking to, uh, to uh, demonstrate and to uh, show off my wealth and my success. I have a great aunt. I've told this story before, too. I know I'm closing up tonight. She's holding this Pentecostal. Her husband went out and bought her a car. What car did she want? She wanted a Cadillac. Well, that's all right. She wants a Cadillac. He makes good money. She don't wear an ounce of jewelry. She don't wear... You know, expensive watches, none of that. Of course, a lot of holiness women will wear clothes that are expensive like you want to believe. Which is, I got news for you, one sixth of this half a dozen. If you're going to wear a dress that costs a thousand dollars or eight hundred dollars or two hundred dollars, you might as well go ahead, honey, and just put on the diamond ring. One sixth the other's half a dozen. You're just showing off your wealth, you're just showing off your in a different way. That's all you're doing. But my great aunt, what does she get? She gets some Cadillac, but just not any Cadillac. It has to be a Cadillac that has all the gold trim. The grill is gold. All the trim on it is gold. It is the ugliest, most gaudy, most ostentatious thing you've ever seen in your life. And then she says, 
Oh, but you know, everywhere I go, people are always complimenting me on my car, and oh, it just gets so much attention. Yeah, like that's not why you wanted it to begin with. <laughs> Lady, you're wearing a necklace. You're wearing a diamond ring. You're wearing a brooch. The only difference is the one you're wearing, you get to drive. But it's doing the same thing. It's serving the same purpose. So what irritates me is when these legalistic people, Martin, have taken all these concepts and all these precepts of Scripture and legalized them. Heaven or hell, if you cut your hair, woman, you're going to hell. Um, excuse me, first of all, you don't understand. There's so much about that issue I could go into, but I'm not going to. But in a nutshell... In a nutshell, Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 clearly, clearly explains that within the culture of the Corinthian people, if a woman had hair that had been cut or shorn, that it gave the appearance that she had been unfaithful to her husband because one of the uh, traditions in that culture, Martin, was that a woman who was married would let her hair grow naturally. She would not cut it. She would not put scissors to it. Nowadays, we do something different. We wear wedding bands. In that community, in that culture, they would leave their hair uncut. So if you saw a woman who had a head of hair went down to the ground, you knew she was married. And if she cut her hair, uh-oh, that was a punishment that they, they used to meet out on women who commit adultery. Or women who are caught in the act of prostituting themselves. They would shave their head. Or they would cut their hair real short. And it was a shame to those women for their hair to be cut. Because now... For years they're walking around and it's like having the scarlet letter, you know, on your on your blouse. Everybody knows what you've done. For years, as that hair tries to grow back out, see? So Paul writes to the Corinthian women, he said, This is a practice within Corinthian culture, within Corinthian society. Therefore, even though as Christian women you could cut your hair. Because God's not telling you not to cut your hair. The culture says. He said, you still don't want to do it because if you do it, you're making your husband look like a sap. Because you're making people believe that you've been caught in the act of adultery. Do you follow what I'm saying? He said, you're dishonoring your husband by doing that. Because you're making him look like, oh boy, that man's wife has been out messing around on him. Do you follow what I'm saying? In modern culture, it'd be like a couple getting married and the husband refusing to wear a wedding band, let's say. Well, what does that look like? Well, it looks like he's trying to keep the message out there that he's available. Trying to, you know, he's trying to hide the fact he's married. Well, the same basic thing was true of women cutting their hair. Paul said, you can't, you don't want to do that. You don't want to do that. Because if you do, you're going to be sending a message that is going to be dishonoring your head, dishonoring your husband. Do you follow what I'm saying? Yeah. Paul explained all that. Now, the holiness people come along, and they make a law out of that. A woman can't cut her hair. If she cuts her hair, she's going to hell. Well, first of all, when I got married years ago to a woman, as part of my wedding vow, which I wrote my ceremony, she made a vow that her hair left uncut would serve as a symbol of her submission to me as her husband and as the priest of our household. In other words, I was actually incorporating the why of this belief into why we were doing it that way. Most holiness women, they don't even know why they do it. They just, all they know is UPC tells me. My great aunt, I told her one day years and years ago when I was still in the movement, I told her, I said, I appreciate your standard, you know, because, oh, us holiness people love to compliment one another for being so holy. I said, I appreciate your standard. I appreciate you're not cutting your hair. And my aunt said, oh, well, you know, the United Pentecostal Church tells me I shouldn't cut it, so I don't cut it. 
That's as much of an understanding as she had about it. That's as much. It was the law. It was a dictate. It was a rule. She was following the rule. Didn't have anything to do with her love for God. Didn't have anything to do with her love for her husband. Didn't have anything to do with submission to her husband as the priest of their household. Nothing. Do you follow what I'm saying? Yeah. That is what we are not under today. That is what we are not. No. Now we're under the perfect law of liberty. But... And we're going to get to it in our next round. But not everything you can do should be done just because you can't do it. We have to be mindful of the weaker. Amen. We have to be mindful of our testimony. Would you stand with me tonight?